Okay, so I'm gonna go over the PA driver's manual. In the past, you guys, we already went over chapter two of the PA driver's manual. I'd like you guys to go ahead and scroll. Does everybody have it on the thing? Okay, go ahead and scroll all the way to chapter three, right at the beginning of it. Okay, and right in the beginning of chapter three, after you get all the test questions from chapter two, Okay, you should see learning to drive. Okay, so give me a thumbs up if you're where it says vehicles check preparing to drive. Good, good, good. Aaron, are you there? Okay, so, all right, so let's start. So um, preparing to drive, this is a very important thing. Okay, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of goofy and like whatever, but that, you know, that, that we're even talking about it, but it's important. The habits that you have when you prepare yourself to drive every day, especially when you come out of your house, is extremely important, okay? Um, you know, I have a house where I come out and I can see the back of my car. A lot of you guys, your car might be down the driveway. Raise your hand if it's kind of that way. Your car's kind of like down the driveway. Nobody? You can't see the back of your car? Yeah, okay. So you really can't see the back of your car. So the first thing that you should do is go and check and look behind it, make sure there's not somebody's bike sitting there or a little kid doing sidewalk truck or whatever, or an animal back there. You don't want to back over something that you didn't expect to be there, okay? That sounds goofy, but it does happen. You should really check behind your car, okay? Uh, number two, I, of course, yesterday I got to do my uh, winter thing, okay? So, like I've said before, my winter thing is basically you go outside when there's snow all over the car, Okay, I turn on the car first, crank up the defrost, highest level, okay, and that melts all the ice off the windshields. Okay, start from the top of my SUV and get all the snow off the top, all the ice, brush all the snow off the windshields, work my way down, get all the ice off the wind, snow off the windows, okay, the mirrors, just take care of that all. Um, shovel the driveway if I have to, okay. Uh, but that's, that's what you wanna do. And then you might still have ice on the windows, let the defrost take care of that. Don't sit there and scrape it. Go back in the house. You know, finish up what you need to do to get ready. Okay, get warm. Okay, whatever you do, coffee, breakfast, whatever you do. Okay, um, and then 10 minutes later, you go out and there'll be no ice on the windows. You can just brush it off or probably just melted it all away. You don't have to worry about anything. Okay, so um, that's the way I'd encourage you to do it. Uh, you don't have to sit out there and scrape and, you know, get your knuckles off sore and whatever, but it's, I, that's the best way to handle it. Um, after that, okay, so that's just talking about poor weather snow, which you guys are gonna have to deal with at some point. Now, um, when I get into the car, okay, now my own car, it's all set up for me, I'm good to go. Unless my wife like took it to the store or something the night before, I'm 6'2", she's 5'4", so uh, she changes all the mirrors and everything, so you know, and change the seat. And I'm like, oh, so I gotta adjust all that stuff. If she's been in it. Okay, same thing for her car. If I've been in her car, I change everything. I push the seat back, I change the mirror. You know, so depending on who's driven your car prior to that, you might have to make sure you rearrange everything. Okay, so you've got other people that are different height than you in your, in, that use the car. Okay, so make sure your rear view mirror is positioned so you can see everything in back of you. Make sure your side view mirrors, that's the way I like them, are pushed out all the way so you can completely see your blind spots. You're not able to see your blind spots through side view mirrors if you can see the sides of your car. Okay, push it all the way out, those, those, those side view mirrors, so you can see those. Um, make sure the seat is back far enough so you have at least a foot between you and the steering wheel so the airbag will deploy properly. Um, so you just kind of pre-stuff before you even start. And then here's the big one, okay? And it seems kind of goofy, but make sure you put your seatbelt on before you start to back out of the driveway, before you put your car in park, into reverse, make sure you put your seatbelt on, okay? It's annoying, and some people have the habit of kind of pulling out of the driveway and then putting the seatbelt on. I gotta admit, it's a bad habit, because I, I had to break it, okay? So, you know, going down the street, no, I gotta put my seatbelt on. Just get in the habit early, as soon as you get in the car, okay? Even before you turn it on in the winter, just put your seatbelt on, just get in that habit to where you don't even think about it, okay? Um, and it can be very distracting putting it on late. Uh, I think I got everything. Uh, adjusting head restraints if you need to. Uh, 
Make sure you have your glasses or your eyewear. If you, or, and uh, the recommendation is to lock your doors. That's up to you. A um, couple of things. Okay, as, uh, distracted driving, we're not, we've, we've already had a whole unit on distracted driving, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just to remember uh, that um, daydreaming is the number one cause. Cell phone is number two. Uh, so keep that in mind. And this is a kind of an interesting stat. Teenage dialing a cell phone misses a, misses, um, uh, oh boy, where's, where's it? Misses the same, oh, misses the same event 53% of the time. So it's extremely distracting. Okay, right here where it talks about lack of sleep, just scroll down a little bit, lack of seat, sleep. Uh, I, I just think these are two important statistics that you need to know. It's estimated that 18 hours with no sleep impairs your driving ability as much as a blood alcohol level of 0.05. That's reaction time, your ability to process information, your ability to see things and interpret things before they happen. The same as if it was a 0.05. 24 hours of no sleep, it's actually your perceptions and your, and your, and your, impa your impairment is above 0.10, which is well above the legal, lim legal limit. So it's the same type of distract. It's not illegal, but you're basically in the same mental state, okay? So sleep deprivation is a very, very real thing, okay? Uh, every year across the U.S., falling asleep while driving causes at least 100,000 crashes, 1,500 people die, and 40,000 are injured in those crashes, okay? Of the 100,000 vehicle crashes linked to drowsy driving each year, almost half involve drivers between the 15 and 24-year-old age group. You guys tend to be out late more, okay? You tend to be out late more. You tend to stay up late more. Okay, and you know, maybe stay up all night and then drive home from somewhere. Okay, so that's a very real thing and you can be extremely distracted. So please keep that in mind. All right, uh, we spent a lot of time on alcohol. We're gonna skip over that. There won't be questions on that on there. This is the important part that we need to get to. Now, just like chapter 11, that was the textbook for this chapter. Okay, this is a little bit more specific to Pennsylvania. Um, I think it's very important that you know your driving zones. Give me a thumbs up if everybody's on managing space for the driving zones. Is everybody with me? Okay. Riley, are you with me? The zones? Okay. So there's six driving zones. The first one, driving zone one, is directly in front of you. And that is your main focus point. Okay, now I'm going up to where it says keep a space cushion ahead, the uh, four second rule. Okay, you want to be following vehicles at about a four second following distance. That's what you're trying to work toward, a four second following distance. You pick out an object like the tree, okay? And when the car in front of you passes it, you count. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000. If you haven't reached the tree yet, then you're a good distance away from that car. If you're going 20 miles per hour, that's not a huge distance. If you're going 55 miles per hour, that's going to be the length of a football field. It's going to be 100 yards and 300 feet. Okay, so keep that four-second rule in mind. Uh, it'll help you to avoid crashes. It'll help you uh, to identify things quicker, and it'll help you to react to things quicker. It's a, very important as a young driver to make sure you have a lot of distance. Now, you should allow longer distances when roads are wet or slippery, okay, when traction is an issue, uh, when a driver behind you wants to pass, okay, there must be room ahead of you for passing and for them to pull in front of you, okay? So you should even slow down even more to let them get in front of you. You are following a driver whose rear view is blocked, okay? Drivers of trucks, buses, vans, cars pulling a camper, okay, things like that. Not only are they higher and harder to see around, okay, but they can't see you, okay? So when you go to pass, okay, if you're too close to them, they have, there's more of a chance that they're gonna cut you off because they can't see you in your rear view, their rear view mirror because you're blocked. So anytime a driver can't see you, you wanna pass them from, a, a, from the normal following distance. Pull into the left lane and then make sure they're seeing you as you approach. Much less chance that they'll cut you off and pull into the passing lane that way. Okay, if they're able to see you in their side view mirrors. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, if you're following a driver who's carrying a heavy load or pulling a trailer, same thing. Uh, not, only is, not only is that a reason not to, but if there is uh, things like uh, bikes or canoes or something attached, 
you don't know how well they're attached, okay? Not a good idea to be following uh, those things that could come undone and fly off. You want room to be able to maneuver, to get out of the way of those things, okay? So try not to follow those things, number one. Okay, if somebody has a big appliance or wood or something in the back of their truck, okay, again, they might not be well secured. Or if they get an accident, it might fly out anyway. So try not to follow those things. Um, approaching slow moving vehicles, including, including bicyclists. You want, you want more of a distance. Uh, following school buses, taxis, public private buses, trucks transporting hazardous substances. Yeah, I don't even know why you'd want to be any close to those. Uh, driving down a hill, it's harder for you to use your brakes and your vehicles, especially at high speeds. Uh, and then also if you're stopped on a hill, if you're stopped on a hill, you want to be a good, you know, a good amount of distance behind the vehicle in front of you. You don't want them rolling back into you. Okay, so that's following distance, making sure, again, when we're dealing with the fir that first straight ahead, you want to try, that's when you're using the SIPTI rule. You're trying to scan 20 to 30 seconds ahead of you. You're trying to identify uh, possible issues or, uh, or problems within 12 to 15 seconds. Okay, you're trying to predict and decide what to do. Uh, predict what might happen and decide what to do. And then by making a maneuver, which usually involves either slowing down or some type of a turning maneuver. Okay, so avoid. Okay, but the more space that you have, the more time you're gonna have to react to something. All right, these other two, uh, Zones two and three, okay? That's your view to the sides, okay? That's your peripheral vision, okay? That's your view to the sides. That's how much you can take in scanning the roadway right and left, getting the big picture, okay? Hopefully, you can take a lot in to where you can see what's going on and you can predict what might happen, who might pull out in front of you, uh, any type of space issues that we talked about last class that you're trying to avoid or trying to get over to the right or the left, or slow your speed down if you really can't get away from those spatial issues like we talked about when cars are really congested or whatever the case might be. When you identify that you do have things blocking your view, like cars or trees or, or whatever, bus stops, things blocking your view, you really want to slow down your speed and anticipate that somebody might step out from behind a truck or open a car door, really slow your speed down. So that's areas two and three. The last things that you really want to remember about areas two and three are that those are your escape route areas. If a car pulls out in front of you trying to pass on a two lane road, you don't want to hit them head on head. You want to try to escape, okay? Or if a drunk driver pulls over into the, your lane, you got to get out of there, okay? So you're constantly looking for escape routes in case that happens. Okay? And you should identify times when there is no escape routes and then maybe you know, identify that and kind of slow down and let other cars go so that, so that uh, you know, in dangerous type areas, you're not passing at the exact same time. Okay? So try to identify those zones if you can. You're not always able to. I'm not saying you should all the time, but uh, if there's a really shady area, try not to pass cars at the same time, like a narrow bridge or something like that. Okay. The next zone, zone six, is directly in back of you. Okay, always be checking your rear view mirror, okay, to make sure no one is tailgating you, okay, especially if you're gonna slow down and make a turn and you, you know, put your turn signal on, or warn them well in advance if they're tailgating you. Uh, you know, you should, you sh or you see something that might be coming up, you don't want people following you. You want them to have a four second falling distance, okay? so. Uh, increase your speed or pull over to the side or whatever you have to do to make sure people aren't tailgating you. Okay, if it's a road rage situation, we talked about going to a police station if they're, they won't leave you alone. Okay, otherwise, uh, try to avoid that as best you can. All right, zones four and five. Those are your blind spots to the left and the right. Okay, that hopefully people aren't hanging out in that zone. Okay, but you want to be able to see them. Okay, again, pushing those mirrors out is going to help. Okay, but anytime you change lanes, you should put your turn signal on well in advance, okay? And then you should check your mirrors, and then before you change lanes, say you're going to the left, make sure that you take a quick peek. Okay, after you check your mirrors, you're looking ahead, quick peek, just to make sure you check the blind spot. You've already put your turn signal on, and then you go to the left lane, okay? And then you don't want to spend a lot of time in that passing lane, you want to go, okay? Um, also, when you, then you, after you pass the per person you're passing, okay, you want to make sure that 
you get at least two car lengths in front of them. You really should be able to see that car in your rear view mirror, then put your right turn signal on in that situation, and then you pull over to the right. Okay, pull back into the other lane. Okay, that's how you handle that. That's how you handle those passing situations. So, and also how you handle those blind spots. Okay, anytime you're changing lanes, don't assume that somebody's not coming up from one of your sides. Make sure that you check. Okay, those are your blind spot areas. That's a pretty good view of them. All right, so we've talked about this already, looking ahead and looking to the sides, how you should handle that. We did that, again, 12 to 15 seconds uh, is where you wanna try to identify objects so you can react to them. And then looking to the sides, we've talked about pulling onto a main street, okay? Um, if you're going straight or making a left turn, you always wanna look left first, any cars are coming. If that's clear, then back to the right, make sure that's clear, then left again quickly and then you go. Okay, and you don't wanna hesitate. You wanna be pretty assertive when moving. Okay, left, right, left. All right, talks about changing lanes. So I'm up to managing speed. Okay, as far as managing speed, driving too fast for conditions is the number one reason 16 and 17 year old drivers are involved in crashes. Okay, if you have really congested traffic, don't worry about going the speed limit. Go the speed of traffic, okay? Go the slower speed. If you see a lot of kids nearby or, or, or a lot of people, pedestrians, because whatever might be happening up in front of you, slow your speed. You shouldn't be going the speed limit. You should go slow. If you have a chance that somebody might run out in front of you, slow your speed down. It's just the basic speed law. Okay, the last one, obviously, weather conditions are really poor, okay? Anytime weather conditions are really poor, make sure you're going at a speed that is appropriate for the existing conditions. That's actually a law. It's called the basic speed law. Okay, make sure that you're driving at appropriate speeds. Otherwise, you should be obeying the speed limit that is posted, okay? If there's not a speed limit posted, that you should assume on rural roads, the speed limit's 55 miles per hour, and in residential and city areas, 35 miles per hour. Okay, questions about that? Come on, okay. Driving at night. Okay, driving at night. Okay, uh, the highest crash rates occur during nighttime hours. Most serious crashes occur in the twilight darkness. Um, overall traffic fatalities rates are three to four times higher at night than in the daylight. Compared to driving in the day, driving at night is more dangerous. There are several reasons for this. Your vision is severely limited at night. Glare from the other vehicle's headlights may temporarily blind you, and more people on the road are tired and driving under the influence and are likely to be on the road at night. Those type of people that are tired and driving under the influence. Uh, with less light, your ability to judge distance is reduced, your ability to see colors is reduced, your ability to see things in side vision, um, and your ability to react to other things are all reduced. Anything that is unexpected, you're not gonna have as much time because you cannot see them as clearly. Same thing with pedestrians, bicyclists, animals, okay? Um, you're much more likely to be surprised at night compared to signs and other roadside objects. Pedestrians are the hardest thing to see at night. Okay. Um, you must use your headlights properly at night and at other times. Uh, headlights have a dual purpose. Uh, they're for you to see and for other people to see you. So make sure your headlights are cleaned off uh, appropriately, especially like with snow and that kind of thing or any type of, if you go through like a sandstorm or something like that, make sure they're cleaned off so you can see clearly. Um, state law requires drivers to use their headlights in these situations. And we've talked about a lot of these, okay? When they cannot see because of insufficient light or gray days, or in heavy traffic when the vehicle may uh, um, uh, seem to blend into the surroundings. I showed you a, a slide of that last, last class, okay? So uh, it's just there's not a lot of light. There might be a lot of shadows or uh, dusk or dawn situations. It's very easy to disappear into the background. That's times when you want to have your lights on. Okay, if it's real overcast, there's no sunlight, same thing, a real gray day. You should have your lights on. Okay, it's very easy for you to disappear into the background. Okay, other people are a lot, able to see you a lot better. Um, anytime you have 
basically the rule is anytime you're using your uh, your windshield wipers, your light should be on. So if you're using your windshield wipers for any reason, your light should be on. Uh, so uh, um, rain, snow, sleet, hail, anything like that. Um, uh, if you, if, 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 fog, if you fog and it's really thick, you should have your low beams on for all those things. Okay, high beams will reflect the light. I will actually blind you. You wanna have your low beams on in those situations. Um, and then obviously when it's dark out between sunset and sunrise, when driving through work zones, you always have to have your lights on in Pennsylvania. And then anytime your vehicle wipers are in continuous or intimate, or, or uh, you're using them at all, your lights have to be on for that too. Okay, state law requires it. it could be up to a hundred dollar fine if you don't do that. Um, also when driving at night, okay? If you are on a dark road, like completely black pitch road, we're talking crane, we're talking fry road, no street lights, no house lights, just pitch black, okay? One of the back roads, okay? That's when you wanna use your bright lights, okay? You'll be able to see her clearly, it'll light up the road, it'll light up the, the side a little bit better, okay? You'll be able to see further, okay? Uh, the rule of thumb there is though, if you can see headlights of another car, you're supposed to turn them off. Okay, go to your low beams. Okay, you don't want to blind that vehicle. If you can see the rear lights of the vehicle in front of you, same thing. Okay, they should be lighting things up for you anyway. Okay, so if you see tail lights or headlights, turn them off. The law requires that you do it if it's head on 500 feet, if you're traveling behind somebody 300 feet. But basically, the best rule of thumb is if you see lights of another vehicle, tail lights or headlights, turn them off. Okay, uh, and they should be lighting things up anyway. If somebody puts their high beams on you in that situation, okay, flick yours really quick, just to let them know, uh, in case they've forgotten and if they still don't get the hint, you're supposed to slow your speed and look to the side of the road, don't look directly into the white lights, kind of look at that white line, kind of hug the white line a little bit, okay? If they forgot to turn their bright lights off, they might not be at their best mental state, so hug the right side of the line too. All right. I know I've talked to you guys about overdriving your headlights. Overdriving your headlights. I'm going to review it one more time really quickly because I think it's important. Night driving. Okay? Night driving at night. Pitch black, dark road. Okay? That's what you typically can see. It's kind of a little off balance. Let's go here. Okay? That's the distance. Yeah, it's a little bit wider than that. That's, the dis that's what you can see with your headlights typically. That's a bit better. Okay, so that's the distance. On average, if you want to see 12 to 15 seconds ahead of you, okay, at night, 45 miles per hour is the recommended speed when it's pitch black like this. Okay, that'll give you 12 to 15 seconds of reaction time if you see something that comes out in front of you. Enough time for most situations to be able to stop. Okay? If you're going 55, okay, you're probably gonna have to do some type of maneuver, okay, because you're not gonna have that full 12 to 15 seconds of stopping your car is gonna be going too fast. Okay, remember, it covers a lot of distance in a short period of time. Okay, so 55 miles per hour, you're probably not gonna have enough time to stop. Okay, you're gonna have to do a maneuver, you know, whatever. Uh, if something happens, it's not a safe. Okay, it's not, you're not gonna give yourself enough time. If you're going 65 in those back roads, now you run the risk of flipping your car over, running into a ditch, hitting a tree to try to avoid something. Okay, so it's very important that you go slower speeds when it's pitch black out. So important. You don't wanna get in a situation where you're overdriving your headlights. Anyone have any questions on that? All right. Important. Okay. Road conditions. Okay. Any, we talked about this last class. When is it most dangerous? When is it most dangerous? Uh, and more, most chance for hydroplaning and roads being uh, slippery, the most slippery. When is it, yes, Riley. When it first Excellent. Right when it first starts raining. Why? Good, there's oil in the roads. There's, there's oil, there's, there's uh, material in the roads. It gathers, 
and it raises to the top as soon as the rain starts. So roads are typically more slippery in a first rain. After, after you know, 10, 15 minutes, typically, maybe not even that long, the oil runs off the road. You, you wa it gets washed away by the rain. Okay, so you still have to worry about hydroplaning, but it's not as bad typically. Okay, it's, at least it's not mixed with the oil at that point. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind, okay? Uh, you wanna go slower speeds. If it's near 32 degrees, okay, anywhere near it, you know, it's kind of like it rained, but then, oh man, it looks like there might be a light snow or something. And you just look at your temperature in the car and it says it's 32 degrees or around that point. Okay, know that there's a real high possibility of black ice on the road. Okay, you'd rather snow than black ice. Black ice is like an ice rink, almost impossible to drive on. If conditions are like that, five miles per hour. Okay, low gear and five miles per hour. You can try to stay off the roads because it's extremely dangerous. Okay? If you do start to hydroplane, okay? It's a little bit confusing. If you start to hydroplane, okay? And you have the anti-lock brakes, just push on the anti-lock brakes. Hopefully that'll keep you from, your car from swaying one way or the other. If it does, if it starts to skid, okay? If it starts to skid, you're supposed to let your foot off the accelerator and the brake and you steer opposite whichever way the front end of your car goes. So if it comes to the left, you can steer to the right. If it comes to the right, you can steer back to the left. Okay, if you get your car under control, now you can brake, okay? And if it starts to go again, one way or the other, let your foot off the brake again and steer opposite the front end of your car. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, think of, think of it in terms of the front end. Always steer away from whichever way the front end of your car is going, okay? All right, and you don't, what happens if you brake too quick and turn the wheel? What would happen? If you like started to slide in one direction or the other and you brake real hard, crank the wheel the other direction. Well, I hear people murmuring, I don't know. Riley. Yeah, it's spin out, okay, 360, okay? Or if you're going fast enough, you might even flip the car, okay? So again, know how to control those skids. Slow your speed, turn opposite. All right, snow and ice again. Uh, slower speeds, switch into the lower gear. Already talked about black ice. Just drive slower. That's the biggest thing that you can do, switch into a lower gear. Okay, obviously I've talked to you guys about getting snow tires, they're better. Okay, making sure that your tires are uh, filled properly, okay, with air, okay, that they're not overinflated or underinflated. You want the entire surface of the tire to be on the roadway. Um, talked about this, visibility conditions. Okay. All right. Try to go the speed of traffic. If it's really congested, okay, slow your speed. That sign is a slow moving vehicle sign. Be aware. If for any reason, okay, your tail lights go out or something, or you know, your lights were to go out, you can use hand signals if you need to, or your white or your white or your turning signals aren't working. Okay, it's the same as a bike signal. Hand straight out to turn left, hand up to go right, hand down. Uh, to slow or tell people that you are stopping. Um, turning and merging. Okay, we've gone over a lot of this stuff, but just as a review, okay? If you are going straight or turning right, okay, and you come to an intersection, okay, what, who, who should yield the right of way? If you're going straight, right, or making a left turn, who should yield the right of way? What's that? Left is always last, left person. If you notice, they're actually showing you the angles that you should take when making right and left turns. Right turns are nice and tight. Slow your speed down when it's real tight like that. About three feet away from the curve, okay? You start to make your turn, real slow speed, and then you accelerate as you start to straighten your car out. Okay, a left turn you have to make wider because you have to get into the wide lane. All right. All right, center turn lanes like we have out in front of the school. You go in those lanes only to make left turns. You do not have the right of way, and you also uh, can't travel in those lanes. You only go into those to make left-hand turns. The center turn lanes, okay, they're only for left turns. 
So know these two signs, no U-turn, no turn on red. You see a no turn on red um, at an intersection, okay? And that would just tell you at a red light, you're not allowed to make a right turn on red. Okay, we talked about merging with traffic. Make sure you have an open gap. It's nice and safe for you to merge. Okay, we've already talked about passing. I'm not gonna go over that again. Okay, we already talked about that. Negotiating intersections we've talked at length about. Remember, look at the, sh the uh, signs uh, and the pavement markings to make sure you're in the correct lane for where you want to go. All right. Talked about that. All right, traffic circles. Again, traffic circles, the things you have to remember, traffic circles. As you're entering onto a traffic circle, you will have a yield sign. Check to your left, if there's an opening for you to go, go ahead. People in the traffic circle have the right of way, you do not, okay? As when you're in the traffic circle, the person that has the right of way is the person exiting. So if somebody puts their right turn signal on to exit, you should let them go, okay? If you have your right turn signal on to exit, make sure you check, don't just leave blindly. Okay, make sure you check to your right just like you're passing, okay? And then, and then you could go, okay? Uh, if you can't, if you can't get off because people are uh, not allowing you to, go around the traffic circle again. Don't, don't, don't uh, get in a situation where you're going to get in an accident. All right. Talked about that. Curves. You just want to make sure that you slow your speed. Okay, and you want to hug the curve. If you're going to the right, you want to be on the right side of the road. If you're going to the left, you want to be on the left side of the road. You want to kind of hug the curve as you're you're going into curves. Okay, you don't want to go off the road. And you want a speed that you can take, that your vehicle can take. So slower speeds. Okay. We're going to talk about parallel parking later. We already talked about work zones. Make sure that you follow the fly guys. Make sure you're looking for people in work zones. Make sure that you have your headlights on the whole time. We talked about railroad crossings at length last chapter. We're not going to talk about that again. Uh, I'll just, just to review from last class, trucks and buses, longer following distance, five to six seconds you can see around them. And again, make sure when you're passing them, they see you approaching from the left lane, okay? Don't just go up behind them and then think that you're going to go and they're going to see you, okay? Make sure that you approach them from a good distance off, a couple hundred feet away. Okay, that is a truck. Those are the truck's blind spots areas. I'm on truck passing. Behind the vehicle, okay, it's hard for them to see outside that side view. And right directly in front of them, they have a blind spot too. So you want to give them a lot of extra room. Okay, that's another thing that you should really know. With trucks, especially like on 6 out of 99, okay, when it's real tight, the intersections are tight, make sure that you stop prior to the stop lines at red lights because those big semi trucks just barely have enough room in some cases to make those turns. If you're ahead of those stop lines, good chance they're gonna hit your car. Okay, so make sure that you stop behind the stop lines, okay, so that there's enough room for the, them to make those turns. Okay, they're set up that way. That's how they paint those lines for that. That's one of the reasons, okay. School buses, we've talked at length about, but again, don't pass them ever when the lights are red. When their lights are yellow, do not pass from behind, okay? You should stop. Don't even pass in front of a school bus if they have their flashing reds on. Look for kids. Okay, if emergency vehicles are coming up on you from behind or in front, you should pull to the right side of the road. Let them pass, okay? Slow your speed. Okay. Uh, we've talked about road rage at length, so we're, we're not going to talk about that now. Um, go with that. Keep going. As you can see, there's a lot of information on here. Basically, the stuff that uh, we'll cover on the test is the stuff that I went over. Okay. Uh, I just think this is much more important. We've talked about driving on the shoulder of the road. It's illegal if, there is, if there's no pavement. Okay. If you ever do go off the pavement area of the road, okay, if you're driving at a, at a decent speed, you want to slow your speed down, okay.
Okay, and remember, if you ever go off-road, two wheels go off the side of the road and it's, it's off the road, uh, you're not gonna have as good a traction, especially if there's a drop. When you come back on the road, you have to deal with off-road recovery. Your car's gonna get shot over to the left and you gotta be ready to bring it back to the right. Okay, don't practice that, it's very dangerous, okay? But off-road recovery is how you have to handle. The best thing to do is to slow your speed down and then come over, uh, it won't be as big of a deal, okay? But if you do do it at a fast speed, it's really gonna shoot your car to the left and you gotta be ready to bring it back to the right, okay? All right, here's all the questions for chapter three, okay? There's a ton of them, okay? You should read through the ones, you should be aware of the ones that deal with the things that we've talked about in chapter 11, basically, the night driving things, okay? So, uh, pretty much all this stuff we've covered, uh, besides parallel parking and a couple of other things that we'll, we'll cover at a later date in the book, but that gives you an idea. And all the answers are at the end of these questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions for me about chapter three? Anything, okay.